I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm uh, substituting in and chairing this panel. The, we're looking at innovations in social policy. And we're very lucky to have with us here, on my left, Rushanara Ali, who is a British Member of Parliament, previously worked for the Young Foundation, and prior to that was leading work in government to respond to the ethnic communal disturbances that took place in Britain in 2001, and Rushanara led the work um, to look into how the government should respond to that. On my right is Denise Misne, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Lehman Foundation in Brazil, and previously led Brazil's leading NGO focused on crime prevention in Brazil. So we've got some great resources, and then in the audience today we have a, a, a whole set of resources. Now I know that your minds are probably spinning. We've heard about, so far today, we've heard about the rising expectations of societies around the world and the new ways that, they're, that, that we've seen youth activism, community activism. We heard in the last session about new tools for taking that forward. And now we're focusing in, in this deep dive on social policy innovation. Before I turn to the panelists, I'd like to hear from you, what is the burning question on your mind that you're sitting in this room hoping is going to be answered in this session? So could I hear from just a couple of you? Is there a, is there a particular question? You've come in here foregoing a walk in the fresh air because you'd really like to hear the answer to, what's that question? Callum. Thank you very much. I'm Callum Miller, Chief Operating Officer here, and your irritant in chief for the purposes of timekeeping. But in wearing this hat, I just wanted to ask the question. In the last session, we talked about, uh, about citizens as consumers of public services. And we got onto the topic of what that made those who deliver public services feel like. I'm really interested in the question of what it makes citizens feel like. Because being, a, being an active citizen is a lot more than just consuming public services. It's also about helping those public services improve and how you consume them. So I'd be really interested in the panel's thoughts on, I guess, the big question of whether the new things we've been talking about over the last half day actually represent a change to the social contract between citizens and the state. And regardless of the answer to that question, what that contract should be looking like in the next few years. Terrific. Any others? So, yes, at the back. Hi, so thank you. Uh, I was wondering, given that you, you oversaw the ethnic conflict in Britain, how is it that we need to think about multiculturalism competing values as we design social policy moving forward? So multiculturalism and social policy. Yep. Yeah, and I'm going to second uh, what's just been said from both sides. Because uh, I'm actually uh, Health Watch England, uh, especially I do all the qualities. I will support a lot of the different agencies. Of course, I'm out on the streets at hard edge because I deal with people with uh, alcohol and uh, homeless and uh, substance troubles and unofficial chaplain to represent the Diocese of Oxford down here. I, I see things go wrong and people don't believe they've heard it all before. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Could you hold the microphone a little further away? Yeah, because we're just getting a distortion. Thank you. So, so I'm and here. your question? Uh, one question is back up what's just been said because I'm sorry to think I'm way about magic wand so we don't, people don't believe that they've heard it all before. Because uh, we don't believe, because they think they aren't going to look in this way, because it's of hostility, which could have caused what happened in London and, and Brazil, the rest of it. So we're trying to lay the piece, but uh, I think there aren't things going on. There's only limited funds going around, can't look in. Like, so I mean, I'm trying to get the piece of trying to think that things have been done differently, because I report back on things I see around me to the national level. So the question, just to back up what's been said from both ends. So, so sort of local versus national. Thank you. Um, and then up here in the front. Thank you. Um, my name is Miklos Lukas Eperen. I'm from Peru. I'm a PhD student at Manchester University. Um, we have been talking about um, the intersections, basically, of public, private, and civil society sectors, and uh, how can they foster change? Through... Nice and loud. It's Sorry. Microphone. Um, this would be a comment and a question at the same time. In uh, I come from Peru, and in emerging economies, one of the biggest problems with uh, government officers is that they love to do design policy, but they do not love to implement policy. Uh -huh. 
because implementation means uh, trials, lawsuits, and accusations of corruption. So how, how can we move, how can we encourage people to take the risk to implement policy? Because most of the uh, qualified uh, professionals that go back to these countries, what they do is they love the design side and the perks that come with it, but they don't like the implementation. Thank you very much. So it's much easier to design policies than it is to implement them. So we'll, we'll ask our panelists about that. Last question before we kick in. Uh, Alberto, Cambridge University. I just wanted to ask whether research uh, being carried out by higher education institutions is actually making any difference in terms of so social policy at the moment. Right. Great. So, um, so some, some great questions there. Um, Rushnara, could I start by asking you, what do you, on this, this idea, we should expect more from citizens, because citizens, what do you expect of your electorate? What do you expect the people that line up and vote for you, and those that don't vote for you, but whom you represent in Parliament? What do you expect of them? Well, I, I think the, picking up on some of the discussions we had earlier today, uh, what's really, the, the thing that's profoundly changing the way citizens engage with politics, with government, with services, uh, and each other is technology. That, that goes without saying. The previous uh, discussion you had about big data and how citizens can use data to empower themselves rather than waiting for government to do it to them or the corporates or whoever to come and do things to them. Uh, they can take, take greater charge of uh, information, but the key is how that information is used and who gets to use it uh, and where power lies within that uh, dynamic. So that, that's a key point, uh, I think, that's really radically going to change, is already changing the relationship between uh, the state and citizen, politics and citizens. Uh, and I think it, when it comes to uh, how political parties respond, I think political parties, just as governments uh, and public uh, officials, are finding that a big challenge. And I think that they need to open up they need to think much more imaginatively about the way that they connect with citizens and their aspirations, their ambitions for the way they expect to co-design and co-create policies that affect their lives. And technology is the key driver to that challenge. And if you look internationally, uh, go, well, I'll, I'll, actually I'll give you a couple of examples of where citizens in my own constituency um, have in different ways used their uh, their collective power um, in order to challenge established political, um, well, I suppose, received wisdom. One of them is that in the 2005 election, um, my seat, my constituency, Bethnal Green and Bow, uh, has been held by the Labour Party, my party, since 1945. It's a heartland Labour seat. Uh, because of the war in Iraq, um, a lot of few people, both on the left as well as from uh, from within the Muslim community, it was a coalition, uh, decided that they were, were not going to support the, my party. Uh, and the trust that had built up, had been there for a long time, uh, broke down. And they used the democratic process to organise themselves through a mix of community-based traditional politics, uh, uh, not necessarily very much to do with technology at that point, in order to challenge the established, uh, established um, uh, uh, party that was my party at the time. Uh, and that, that was a very difficult thing to do, um, but that's one example, again, mainly through traditional means that citizens were challenging a political party to say, we expect uh, you to listen to us. Uh, and certainly that sets a challenge on me, having won the seat back from George Galloway, to never, um, uh, you know, always bear in mind that even if you are in, a, uh, in, a, in an area that has traditionally been a supporter, supported one party, that uh, those kinds of challenges require proper conversation uh, and uh, interaction in order to find a way of reflecting, not necessarily mirroring, but reflecting the concerns of your constituents, particularly on big profound issues like war, uh, whether to go into war in a, with a, in a country or not. Um, and the second thing is about modern technology and how that gets used to organise protests and campaigns. So one of the things, some MPs will say 38 degrees is you know, the bane of their lives, but most will say 
that is a really useful way of getting the temperature of what your constituents feel like about particular issues. When you get hundreds of letters about the same issue, that triggers discussion in Parliament among colleagues, but also triggers debates and can um, revert, lead to U-turns. We saw that in the forests campaign against uh, forests. You know, I got hundreds of letters about forests. And I started to wonder there was, whether there was a forest in my constituency or not. But the point, the point was that people were really concerned about access to the countryside, to forests, and then they felt it was a very English, very British campaign, but a really powerful one about how people felt. Similarly with school sports and many others like that. So I think technology plays a big role, how people connect with each other and what would they expect. And of course you can fast forward that in terms of the Arab Spring and what's happening in other countries. And so the challenge for any democracy or, or those that are not uh, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, is that um, they, they, need to, they, they will need to constantly, if you're a democracy, an old democracy like ours, we need to constantly adapt and change and reform and do it fast, otherwise uh, you become irrelevant uh, and, and institutions become less relevant uh, and less able to deal with the social challenges of, of our time. Thank you very much. Um, Denise, you might take up this question of, well, two, two questions. So it's much easier to design policy than it is to implement it. And what's the impact of academic research? After all, lots of academic research is really about designing policy and not about implementing. Now, you've spent a lifetime working at the interface of trying to take those ideas and actually implement them and make them work. Can you share some, some lessons on that for us? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Narian. It's a pleasure to be here. I think, it's a, I think it's a critical point because a lot of us spend a lot of time thinking about how to design this great, amazing uh, policies and, you know, are spending time in research. And, uh, be, of course, there's a good reason to do this. There's a, you know, although we talked a lot about big data, there's an awful lack of data, like relevant information for decision making to be made. But, I think that we saw from very early that there's a big disconnect between the data that we have and the, and the actions that were taken. And so I'll get from just a, an example from what you mentioned and then we can go from there. But uh, when I started, when I was in law school, we started a big campaign, a big movement for gun control in Brazil. And the reason why we started that was basically evidence-based, right? We, we saw that uh, boys from 15 to 24 we're actually the most, uh, the group that's most victimized by gun violence in Brazil and all over the world. This was exactly our age group at the time. Uh, and it's basically young people killing young people. And in 90% of the cases, they had a gun between them. And the general debate on, on violence and homicides in, in, in Brazil and many other countries was either related to uh, police brutality or to organized crime or something on, of that sort or social inequality. But when you look at homicide data, what you're seeing was it's actually regular, poor, young men living in the periphery of urban areas killing each other. And when you look further deep in those uh, issues, you'd see that in 60% of the cases, there was a futile reason for that to happen. So it was basically a, a culture of violence that was leading this. But none of the actions that were taken were based on reducing this culture of violence or the means, the access to violence, which is the access to the gun. So I'm using this. So we started a campaign saying, OK, let's try to change the attitude and change the gun. But we were not looking at publishing another report or looking at by getting this data and then strategizing for change, which I think was very much what we talked in the beginning here. And by strategizing for change, uh, when we're looking at it, I think is once you're pushing for policy, and we pushed a lot for policy and were able to approve a, a law in Congress in the pre-internet era, uh, very long time ago, 2003, exactly 10 years ago, uh, we got to, to push this new law in, in, in Brazil that called the Disarmament Statute that basically banned carrying guns, so nobody can, no civilian can carry a gun in Brazil, put a series of regulations on how you manufacture, how you sell weapons, uh, how you carry, all kinds of penalties, but we were so happy after that victory. Like, you know, we got this, you know, great victory, got the gun lobby, the Brazilian version of the NRA to lose, that, you know, maybe we didn't spend enough time thinking about the most difficult part of it, which is implementation. So I think a lot of the social movements that we're seeing today and a lot of debate about people power, if we don't start to make the connection 
between what comes afterwards, it's very hard. And we learned this and pushed very hard with other groups that we needed the universities, we needed data gathering, we needed expertise, but in order to think about now, once you have this, this is where, where your problems begin. So measuring the effectiveness of the law and then helping the law to become more effective in itself by implementing it and verifying that this is actually having results. I don't want to take much time, but I'm happy to go into any of the uh, parts of making this happen. But I think that we only learned today, we have 10 years afterwards, we have 90% less uh, guns sold uh, in Brazil than we used to have before the law. Even if we lost the referendum that Felipe mentioned in 2005, this was one article of the law, it was the total ban on gun sales, but all the rest of the law is basically there, but only 50% is implemented. So working, and it's much more about protesting, is working with government. So I think it goes to the sense of, if you really want to become an active citizen, uh, and if you really want to have a say in how policy is being made, you have to kind of be prepared to also think about how you're going to help this uh, to become reality. But I think we have a, I think there are very, very good ways in which you, we can do this, especially in this technology age, and I'm happy to talk more about this. Terrific. Um, well, so we've opened up some answers, just the beginnings of answers to some of your questions. I'd now just like to get um, to ask each of our panelists, well, Ushanar, I'd like to start by asking you, as you've already mentioned, you, live, you, you represent a constituency which, which has a, you know, a host of various needs and, and, um, and issues in it. What to you, um, are there particular social policy innovations which you think are working in your constituency would be my main question. And what's the one innovation that you dream about for that constituency? Uh, so, so just to give you, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the East End of London, just to give you a, an illustration, my constituency is sort of uh, between Canary Wharf and the City of London. Uh, it's sort of sandwiched between them. And uh, the borough includes Canary Wharf. It also includes the Crown Jewels, um, in case you didn't know. Um, uh, and that used to be part of my constituency. So I was a bit gutted when I discovered that because of the boundary changes, uh, I didn't get to represent the crown jewels because that would have been an interesting twist on the whole uh, um, idea of empire striking back. But, uh, but, but, but leaving all of that to one side, um, what we have is huge amounts of wealth and opportunity. We also have the Olympic Village, which is next door, uh, to at, almost adjacent, so you can it touches on my constituency, where thousands of jobs were created. Um, and so in terms of what the one, the, what's the one thing that I would do, um, well, it's connected to something that was achieved uh, throughout, through, through uh, a mix of, of innovations, which was around education. So in the early 90s, less than six, about 16% of kids left school in my borough, Tower Hamlets, with five or more grade eight A's to C uh, uh, out of uh, GCSEs at the age of 16. Um, through very intensive work um, and partnership and investment, partnership with the private sector, with uh, the business community who did a lot of mentoring, teaching partnerships, helping, very much getting into schools. Um, and it was a very strategic partnership, um, as well as putting some resources in. Um, uh, and government investment through that period and a very concerted effort between local education authority and teachers over a period of 15 years you saw a radical transformation in educational attainment so uh, over 80 percent of kids by the time you get to 2010 uh, were getting five or more GCSEs so it's an inversion of the results we were getting um, in the early 90s so that's a good example of how uh, a whole community private sector parents and children um, and teachers coming together deciding they were gonna, they're going to lift uh, kids out of poor performance did actually happen and it was through innovations like after school activity which um, I was fortunate enough to work with Michael Young who's the founder of uh, the Open University and many other some 40 organizations in his lifetime uh, and one of the things he set up was a project called Extend, uh, Education Extra, which is a precursor for a national program that was set up by the last Labour government called Extended Schools, 
which is about using school buildings for extra classes for parents and kids, all about supporting the wider community to develop. That got parents into schools. That got parents who had traditionally felt left out, didn't feel, uh, particularly those who are not middle class, that they could connect with teachers in the school environment. Um, and also uh, things like summer universities, another program that we were involved with setting up, uh, to get kids into arts and creative forms of uh, learning outside of school hours during their vacations so that they could develop their wider talents, their creativity and so on. And that helped to improve uh, performance but also it kept them out of trouble and it helped to reduce youth crime. So it was a mix of that sort of partnership working along with proper investment, along with investment in school buildings and so on. So it took a, took a it literally took a whole generation uh, to find the, to transform education. So that's so. So what you get by the time you get to uh, the noughties is more and more young people who are coming out of the education system with degrees, first generation university educated students. And uh, what I discovered as a parliamentary candidate was that as people were coming out, this is just before the recession, uh, they were still finding it very hard to get jobs in the in those places. Uh, in, you know, on their doorstep, like the financial sector or in the professional jobs. So that if there was one innovation that I would get the government to back, it's something that uh, uh, is about helping young people who are not in work, and that's a million people in the UK, many of them are it's a sizable number in my constituency in the East End of London, uh, in helping to develop the skills uh, to help them make transitions into the world of work. These are soft skills, they're not necessarily the qualifications, they've often got them, but it's about making that transition um, uh, very quickly with the support of employers as well as, um, uh, as, well as uh, um, not-for-profit organisations and so on, in order to help them make that rapid change into work. Because if you take an example like graduate unemployment, which I have a high, high amount of in my constituency, um, where also 42% of children live in poverty, uh, it's one of the highest in the country, and you have high levels of uh, inequality, income inequality, because we have a lot of people who live in, work in the city and Canary Wharf um, and live in the borough. So you've got this, these extreme inequalities in, in one borough. If you could find a way of connecting them up um, in order to get the skills needed, you could get graduates into work. That would lift a lot of families out of poverty very quickly uh, if they had one income, at least one income earner in those families where they've got graduates. So that's one thing that I would do immediately if, if, um, <laughs> if, I, if my party was in government. So is there anyone in this room who's working on that issue, how you get the students who are performing in school, including you, Denise, um, into jobs afterwards. Is anyone working on that in this room? No? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it um, about whether we, about innovation in that area. Um, Denise, I imagine, having looked a little bit when I was in Brazil at what the Lehman Foundation and some of the foundations you're working with are doing on education, that some of what Ushanara had to say rings bells. Um, have you seen the same innovations happening in Brazil and are they working? Yes, yeah, definitely, I mean, rings a bell. We, are, we have a problem in education and PISA results were just out and in, in, uh, in many countries represented here, maybe a good part of it, they participate on that. And the PISA is the OECD measurement on education. Brazil, uh, very well performed, really well. We're number 59 out of 65. Um, it's, uh, I'm saying it performed well because the government kind of celebrated because Brazil, they found a good number there, was Brazil got the highest increase in math results between 2003 and 2012, which is amazing. Uh, we're still in the same position against other countries and only 0.7% of our kids perform in the highest levels of the PISA 5 and 6. and around 66% are in one and two, uh, the lowest grade. So it's, it's not a very good place to be. And a lot of what we're seeing is how can you innovate, also in terms of expanding school hours, and we have programs like that in Brazil, very successful ones, uh, not only expanding school hours, think, but really thinking about 
how we can bring this, everything we have been talking about here about technology inside classrooms and inside education. I think this is important because when we're thinking about technology, if we think with our mindsets of 20 years ago, we would think that technology is there to kind of massify something, make something like equal to the masses that could be. And today, in everything that we're talking about and thinking about the first question on, on the role of the citizen, everything now is about personalization on one hand and about collaboration on the other, which seem to be a contradiction, right? Because if it's so personalized, it's so made to you, how come uh, this is enabling you to collaborate? But this is exactly what we're doing in many areas of our lives, from you know, how we buy books or how we search internet, how we travel. Uh, we have things more and more tailored to ourselves. So most of the work the Foundation has been uh, leading in this past two years has to do with how we can bring personalization and collaboration to the classrooms and to education. So most of the innovation we have been involved with is, first, is to help set up a, a entrepreneurial uh, uh, community in ed tech, in Brazilian technology and education, and we're supporting a series of entrepreneurs there. We're also working with, some people here might be familiar with Khan Academy, uh, the platform that helps learning math. So we brought this to Brazil uh, two years ago. Uh, today, Brazil is the largest uh, use of Khan Academy after the United States. Uh, and we brought this, we made an experiment in, our, in public schools in, in Sao Paulo, very poor areas. We said, what if we bring, you know, individual, you know, one computer to each kid, but not the computer, but with the software, with the teacher training, and having, uh, having the opportunity of kids to, each one of them, under the guidance of the teacher, but each one of them to have the autonomy to kind of learn on their own pace and progress at their own pace and kind of, this is the personalization path, but since the teacher has a dashboard with the, that's the big data component, but very easy for them on how teacher, how each kid is doing, you can enable the collaboration part of it because teachers are allowed to see, you know, maybe these kids are actually doing very well in this area and they can collaborate with this other two. So the classroom mixes kind of individualized moments that are very suited to you with collaborative moments that give empower kids because an eight-year-old is teaching another eight-year-old on how to deal with, you know, fractions. And this other eight-year-old didn't learn from the teacher, was not able to learn by themselves, but maybe with another eight-year-old explaining to them in a non-technology uh, way, so in a personal way, it, they can learn by it. So we're doing this. We start with 200 kids. Uh, we have 12,000 now using this in public schools, and we're going to have 100,000 uh, starting next, beginning of February uh, next year. Uh, and this experience, experiments like that are showing us that there is a, we're starting, I just got some results when I was entering here, and we're, got, we're seeing good results in terms of learning, and we're also seeing a lot of good results in terms of the soft skills that we're mentioning, in terms of you know, the ability to collaborate, the, how you learn, how you become more resilient, how you can have a school that is more suited to you, and how you learn how to solve problems in your own way. So this is a very small example, but I think there is a, there is a whole opportunity for us uh, in terms of how we bring technology, not only into education, but into many other areas. But we have to think, I don't, I don't see this as uh, giving more, you know, it's, it's more trouble for the citizen because it, it, I see it in another way. I think it's a better use of our time. In all of these areas where we're using technology, be it if you're using ways to get from one place to the other faster, which is becoming a fever in Sao Paulo with our great traffic, or any other kind of crowdsourcing mechanism, it's actually about, you know, you're using something where you're collaborating and you're getting a, an extra benefit of making things kind of, you know, smarter and, and, and a better, more efficient use of time. So I think if we can think about that, we might see some changes in some of the really resilient social problems that we have been able to tackle in the past. Decades. And Denise, if you were advising Ushanara for her constituency to do exactly this, what would you warn her are the, the most difficult parts of making it work? I think if we want to bring uh, innovation into education, there are two aspects at least in, in Brazil. One of them I think is universal. First one is how you work with teachers and how you think about, you know, it's you cannot see uh, major changes in education happening without involving teachers. And by involving teachers means really rediscussing the role of the teacher and giving them tools to, to be able to perform. It's all about implementation. 
as we said before. And, and so I think this is one critical aspect. Uh, the other aspect is, I think as, as much as we think about components of the curriculum, and I think learning math through Khan Academy is a component, I think what we really have to think about is the curriculum itself. Uh, we, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with the debate in, in, in the UK as much as I should be, but in most places, what we expect our kids to learn when they leave school has nothing to do with what they really need to know when they leave school. We're keeping kind of a, a 19th century or 20th century curriculum, early 20th century, but we have 21st century kids, and we're seeing this. We're seeing, not, you know, we have very few countries doing a great job in education. Most countries are failing, most teachers are failing, most, you know, most kids are failing. There's something wrong with how we're tackling the issue. It couldn't be that everyone is wrong. There is something about the, what we expect our kids to learn that is. So I think a big debate in terms of leaving school and being able to take a job maybe has to do that I'm, you know, actually there are things where they would not be failing, maybe. And so I think there are a lot of experimentations to be made there, but this is a critical debate we need to have. And Rushinara, you know what I'm going to ask you. If you were advising <laughs> Denny's to do what has been done in your constituency, opening up the school, bringing the parents in, the summer universities, the extra after-school activities, what would you advise him is going to be the biggest challenge to making that work? Well, I think the main, main lesson from the experience uh, in my borough has been it takes time and it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of consistent um, focus uh, and it requires institutions, uh, including schools and teachers, to be open. And yeah. so it's about finding a, a set of uh, incentive structures and in, in inspiring and instilling a, a sense that uh, everyone's there, in a, everyone's collaborating to raise standards and improve the results and the, the uh, life chances of. Uh, they, they describe them, a lot of teachers do, uh, I expect, but certainly when I talk to kids, uh, teachers in, in, in all the schools, they, they talk about their kids. And they don't just talk about their kids in their own schools, they talk about the whole borough. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it is about persistence, it's about backing teachers up, as well as the, the people who are working in that way, uh, that is showing the results, and you're not necessarily going to get the results straight away. And the second thing is, certainly from the UK experience, that there is each time with any government, including uh, you know, the, the last government, which, was in, which is my party, when there is a new, uh, new idea or a new um, policy, sometimes uh, the expertise, or quite often the expertise of the frontline uh, practitioners gets neglected mm -hmm. and things get imposed on them. So if you have a powerful alliance of uh, these key actors on uh, agents of change on the ground and they can demonstrate that their method is working, which is what many of the teachers in my constituency did when uh, they were being asked to uh, roll out lots of academies. Um, I don't know if they'll be able to resist the current government's pressure, uh, <coughs> but they'll certainly put up a fight because they feel that their approach is getting the results. And if, you, if they've got the evidence and they've got the results, it's a much better position to, to fight back from and say, we know what we're doing, leave us to it. So I think c creating a framework that allows, just as you said, allows uh, control and autonomy within a framework of raising standards is, is critical. But you raise a really important point about innovation, which is you know, it's very fashionable to talk about the need for every organisation to have a culture of innovation, to innovate all the time, but Rushanara, you're actually warning us that innovation can be an enemy of itself. You've talked about the need to, to take time, persistence, focus. How difficult is it to fend off the next innovation having, you know, in order to make the last one work? Yeah, and I mean, su successive governments get criticised for rolling out initiative after initiative, uh, and the current government is no exception, uh, and ramming down policies down, uh, down uh, schools or, or whichever institution down their throats, even if it's not necessarily uh, pr been proven to work and so on, uh, replacing, it, replacing something that has worked with something uh, that is not of a polit or doesn't fit into the political priorities of the day. So I, I think... Um, I think, I think whether you're looking at a whole system change uh, or individual projects, uh, 
uh, there will be particular points at which uh, it's not clear whether it's going to work. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the things that uh, my colleagues and I were involved in at the Young Foundation is a new model of schools called Studio Schools. Um, and it's taken a few years to get it up and running. Uh, there's uh, some evidence that uh, it's uh, getting good results. But uh, if, uh, if there was very rigorous measurement at this stage of innovation, um, some may say, well, this is not going to work. But if, uh, if you look at that in five years' time, you'll probably get a very different result. So you need to give time to see an innovation thrive and succeed. Uh, uh, rather than sort of consigning it to failure. Similarly, a, another institution that uh, I was uh, in a small way involved with it, called Language Line, um, a telephone interpreting company that was set up in the early 90s, uh, initially as a small pilot with about £10,000 of public funding. Um, and I, I was working there as a student, um, to, sort of doing telephone interpreting, over a number of years, they provided 100 languages in within a minute to public services dealing with emergencies. Um, if you asked me or if anyone came to inspect uh, their performance in the early years, when it was pretty sort of um, uh, pr pr pretty uh, relaxed in the way it was doing the doing the delivery and piloting. Um, Again, if you applied a very intensive, rigorous measurement set of measurements, then it may not have passed, uh, passed any of those tests. But uh, fast forward a few years later, they attracted private investment, and uh, that helped to grow the business, grow, turn it into a proper business model. It became a scalable model with private investment. But that wouldn't have happened if in the pilot development stage, um, people thought, okay, that's done, that's not new anymore, let's move on to something else. So the amount of time you provide something will obviously depend on the scale and complexity of the innovation. But I think, I think certainly um, giving enough time to really test and develop and grow something and also uh, look at how it's financed is critical. Just a comment on that because I think this is critical and kind of, you know, has a connection to the previous panel is on measurement. I think it's, I mean, measurement is of course critical and analyzing data is critical, but how you measure innovative projects, actually how you measure a lot of social policies. I think we're, there is a, at least in Brazil and other parts of the world, I think there is kind of a trend that the ultimate gold standard for measurement is a randomized control trial. where you're going to have this and you're going to have a control group and you're going to kind of pretend it's about physics and that you repeat this experiment, if it gets good results by the economists, then if you repeat this experiment a million times, it doesn't matter anything else, you control for everything else, you have the same results. The problem is this is great and I love measurement and if anyone here is familiar with Mr. Lehman, you understand that I love measurement and it's <laughs> very, very important. But I think we have to be very careful about bringing the idea that everything needs to be measured in a kind of the only scientific way to measure is a randomized control trial and that every result you get in measuring from randomized control trial means that you can, you're able to repeat it a million times. I think it's very, very critical and leads to the point, also connects to the point of the academic research. I think if we're thinking about innovative policy, especially with the use of technology and everything will, will have the use of technology now and over the next five years, uh, Policies change very fast. You can get feedback and change things very, very fast. So you have to have what I think it's more important than ever, but this was always important, but I think more important than ever is you have to know exactly what you're aiming at, what's your goal, and you have to measure your goal, your end goal. The components, you have to be aware of them, but you have to be able to, do, to implement some kind of a, a monitoring system that is able to learn the way you're going, and you're kind of giving enough time on one hand to to kind of see those results. We, just a quick example, we saw a very, very interesting group working with a very new way of, of teaching math that is very, very personalized in the US. Uh, and the first time they measured their results, they were like very disappointed because their kids in their program were performing kind of a little worse than the kids in regular classes. And they were kind of, and when they started looking, once you put together a personalized system, in a school, an adaptive platform for those who are familiar with it, means that the student will spend time in what they don't know, right, at their own level. 
it's, it, the, the case was that in most of the schools where they're implementing this, because we're low performing schools, kids were actually at a very early stage. So they spent most of their time learning like basic math and first grade math and not fifth grade math. So when they were tested to fifth grade math, they had no, re no improvement. And the other kids, even they were not learning fifth, fifth grade math, they kind of remember a little bit the teacher was saying you know, about this. So they got a slightly better uh, result. Once they measured three years after that, once the kids had filled the gap, all the gaps, they were performing much better than the regular students. So sometimes, you know, you have, to, you have to be careful. You have to measure, you have to know what you're doing, but most importantly, you have to have your clear goals and kind of monitor in a way that is not going to, to ruin the experiment because of an early, early result. Great, now your questions. I don't believe that there's no one in the room using randomized control trials in their research. Yeah, so you can. Now's you can, your moment yeah. to be offended. Attack, attack um, me, yeah. Uh, I'm Ana Maria, I'm the wife of Luis Felipe, and I work with education in Brazil also. And I have a question for you too. Uh, how can we engage the government in the major reforms that we need to do in Latin America? Because I know that the situation in Brazil is not different from other countries in Latin America, and the, the, the government refused to see the reforms that we know that uh, we should do. For example, the common curriculum, for example, the training, the, changing completely the career of uh, teachers in, in Brazil and in other countries of Latin America. And it's very difficult to, to see governments uh, uh, looking beyond one term. So this is, what is the tipping point to make them really thinking long term and to do the, the major reforms? Mm -hmm. Thank you, great question. Um, can we take the question from up here? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Alexander. I'm an MPP student at Blah Blah School. I guess my question is that um, it's very good to have all these programs that are in place, but I think a great challenge is really engaging the different stakeholders that are out there. So for example, um, you mentioned about getting parents involved, but I think a lot of times the problem is that parents are, they may not be involved because of motivations or they may just be too busy to be involved in projects at all. So how would you actually effectively engage different stakeholders beyond just the teachers and students in education to get involved in the programs. Okay, so what if parents are just too busy, is the, is, the, is the question there. And then if we come up to the front, there's a cluster of questions here. Ahmed. Thank you, my name is Ahmed, and I'm also an MPP candidate. Um, well, um, my question is, is more about the fast-paced changes in policies um, that you've mentioned, and whether it's actually fast-paced um, because some of the issues that you've mentioned here, particularly the uh, example that you brought about in terms of graduate unemployment, the high, you know, the high percentage of gra graduate unemployment, it does seem like there's a slow detection um, of the issue itself, and that brings in the call of whether the system in a policy context is actually meeting here. Um, sometimes if it, if it ain't broken, you don't need to fix it. Um, the, the proverb goes. And how much actually bring about a change of thinking in terms of the way we design and implement policies, whether you know, proactive policy thinking is needed rather than a reactive one? So is the youth graduate unemployment an early warning? Should we use it as an early warning system? Which is an interesting point down here to the front. Thanks, Kate Jackson with the McKinsey Center for Government. Um, a quick comment and then question. Our education to employment work looks at the role and relationship between educators, students, and employers, because so often there's this time lag like you were talking about to say what we taught them in kindergarten and that teachers were being incentivized to test them to in eighth grade turns out not to be employable by the time they've graduated from high school. Employers are frustrated Teachers are disappointed, students are without jobs, and our education to employment work looks at how you can bridge that gap in real time by saying what are the skills that employers need, and then how do you design curriculum. Um, and then, so the question is, have you seen this working? Is this part of the movement to bring business, which often resists taxes, but then wants the trained workers, to bring business to the table to say what are those 
great skills that you need to employ our kids and then bring teachers to the table to hear, sorry, there may need to be change in order to fill that gap. Great. Um, I'm always tempted when asked about asking business what skills they need um, to, to mention that, I, and I think I've said it to the MPP class, but when I sort of ask different um, public sector leaders from all around the world what skills they thought we should be imparting in the Blavatnik School of Government to these absolutely brilliant students, a very large number of them said the same thing. Teach them to show up on time and to write decent English. Then we'll be happy. <laughs> anyway. Um, right. Uh, a comment here. Uh, my name's Fiona and I'm also a student at the Blavatnik School. Um, I'm really interested in the process of actually taking a small scale innovation um, and I guess scaling it up um, to a larger, to reach a larger sector of the population. Um, so in other words, how do you take a pilot and turn it into policy. I was wondering if um, you were able to share from your experiences with that, um, what considerations should we have in mind as uh, future policy makers? Thank you. Great question. Can, can you scale up <coughs> these innovations? I'm just going to take the last two, one here and one there. Uh, Felipe. I'm Gita Pirama from India. India is about to embark on one of the most ambitious um, change programs uh, ever undertaken, and this is the food security. Um, it's a program which uh, has caused um, credit rating agencies across the world to say you can't afford it. And it will downgrade the country's rating which will change interest rates and lead us uh, into a spiral. At the same time, one's heart says, how can you deny food to people? Mm -hmm. So what, uh, is there any experience in the panel as to should a country embark on something which it can't afford? <laughs> Without loading the question. <laughs> and last one over, over, over here. Felipe, no, down, down here. Sorry. It's down to Tom Elston. Thank you. Uh, Thomas Elston, Research Fellow at the Blavatnik School. Um, this sort of comment and question kind of brings together what some other people have been saying, and it's sort of to do with what institutional arrangements can be put in place to start to enable some of the innovations and the personalised public service um, that, that we've been talking about, and specifically in social policy. Um, and I think there's sort of two perennial issues here. One is the centralization, decentralization tendency. Um, and, and this goes through swings in government, and arguably at the moment we're seeing some radical decentralization, but also some radical centralization at the same time. Um, and you see it in various guises. Um, but the decentralization by idea being uh, local solutions for local problems, but then there's the issue of equality, et cetera. The other issues, it's sort of been implicit in some of our discussion, is, is the co-productive nature of public service. So actually, in the previous session, when we were talking about uh, consumers or customers of public services, actually, it's a bit of a misnomer, because you don't consume a lot of public services. You actually have to partake. You know, the citizen has to be co-productive. Talk to a lecturer about trying to deliver a lecture. Well, actually, you need, you need response, you need engagement, and that's you know, across the wealth, wealth of social policy. I'm just thinking one of the biggest institutional innovations has been um, towards public sector mutuals, so things that are owned by the state, uh, sorry, paid for by the state, but not necessarily owned by the state. Um, I'm thinking in the UK particularly the free school idea, but th there's other, you know, increased use of the third sector or employee buyouts, so civil servants that are buying out and, and running things apart from government. I just wonder, do you see that sort of or increased autonomy for the front line as a useful thing to foster this innovation and these new ideas? Or actually, is that posing new challenges? Is it fragmenting the public service and sort of um, enabling situations that lose accountability and control in a traditional sense? Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've got some clusters of questions here. I, I wonder if we could, the first one I, I think it would be fun to have answers from is about um, it, it was the first and the last. Anna from Brazil asked, how do you engage government? What if the government refuses to see the reforms that are necessary? And Tom uh, Elston just asked, you know, what institutions are needed? How decentralized should it be? 
Um, Denis, you know, in Brazil, is the way forward if, if the federal government doesn't want to do it, do you just work state by state? And, and if the state doesn't do it, do you work community by community? And is that the story we're hearing in London? You, you referred to your borough, uh, Ushanara, certainly not England, let alone the United Kingdom. Is it the local level? Let's, let's sort that out and then ask Fiona's question, if it is the local level, can you scale up from there or are you better not to scale up? Are you better to work at the local level and keep it there? So let's start with that um, simple question, Denise. Yeah. So it's yes, uh, no, and... <laughs> <laughs> um, Maybe. Yeah. So is the government refusing? Okay, I, I think that there's probably an overarching theme in this uh, cluster which has to do in how, we, how can we first mobilize government to do things? Uh, I'm, uh, I think that the best way to mobilize government to do things is about, I mean, we're saying it's about people power. I think we have to, I think the best way to change education, the number that nobody talked about in Brazil about the PISA results was that, you know, I think 85% of the students said they were happy with the school. They're failing. They are, you know, teachers are not showing up, but they're happy. And if you interview <laughs> parents, they are also happy. So it's true. It's, I know you're laughing, but you don't live there. No, I'm not. Uh, uh, but it's true. And, and this is a major problem, right? So stating the problem and try to engage in people in how to change it. Uh, we did this a lot in, in, in the discussion around violence in Brazil, and we got a lot of change uh, after that and, and some very significant results in, in homicide reduction uh, in Brazil. And I think part of it was, you know, in kind of the pre, again, pre-internet era, we used a lot of television. We used uh, soap operas are very popular in Brazil, as you might know. We had debates on gun control in soap operas uh, in Brazil. This was critical to get results. Uh, we got popular, you know, uh, mobilizations and demonstrations with very little money involved, but very creative in terms of how you could show uh, uh, the, the problem that this is real. But as many people said before in the youth activism uh, panel and others earlier, you have to, you know, combine your awareness raising with a clear strategy on how you're going to change. So I think it has to be a combination of mobilization, communications, and here is what you do after you, know, you're, you realize that this is a problem. Here are some ideas on how to do. And then the third component is, and here are the coalition that will help you implement it. And this is hard to do in education, as in many other areas, because it's larger than the four-year term that people have. So I think it's about creating a vision for a different education. Uh, show, in the case of education, creating a vision that is larger than government, but it's having all society seeing you, yeah, that's actually much better than the school. I'm happy with this school, but if I could see this, this is much more important. And then with this vision, you know, spend as much time as getting people emotional about it as being very rational in terms of these are the step by step, one by one, and you have to work hard as, as it was said before, you have to work hard in the implementation side. The, the question about scaling up and decentralization and centralization, I think the critical point is good policies are made by people with diverse backgrounds. And I think this is what's missing. How many times you have a meeting where actually teachers and business and students and parents and you know government and parliamentarians sit together and say okay let's draft some policy here let's work together what's critical to you what's critical to me this seemed to be quite naive actually in brazil we had these councils where you could have representation but the representation system after some years it becomes like in the end, you're a politician, everybody's sitting in the room because they're not representing their own interests, they're representing like large and they're thinking about how they're going to get re-elected to go back to flip. So everybody kind of gets the, the vices of the, the representational system. So maybe technology is giving us an opportunity here. I mean, it's much easier to have participation and, and join conversations. And I think this is exactly what we need to do, but we have to empower to make sure that every needed group is on the table and that this doesn't become a huge like assembly never-ending process but that I think we need better design we need people with different backgrounds sitting together I think that's also the the the, the answer to the uh, kind of centralization decentralization I think what should be centralized 
is our goals. The goals need to be very clear to everyone. Every Brazilian has the right to a top education, and top education means A, B, C, D. You have to be very, very clear, and health, and transportation, whatever. You have to be very clear on your goals, but then how you're going to get your goals, I think it should be decided much more on the local level. And I think autonomy should be given if you're performing, more autonomy if you're not performing, maybe other people can help, maybe there's more intervention needed. So I think there is not necessarily a contradiction between having overarching goals for a country because everybody's part of the same people and have the same rights, but allowing for some room for local knowledge and, and, and adaptation. Last point, um, how to scale up. I think this is critical. The first thing is you have to think that it's going to be scalable from day one. If you're not designing it to be scalable, it won't be, right? Uh, the second thing is this has to do not only with the design but with the people and how hard it is to put together. So I think you have to learn these ideas as fast as possible. We did one thing that scaled really well uh, and was when we started the gun control campaign, we started with gun buybacks. And it was in the beginning, in 12 days, we got 1,700 guns. We're only students and we're not paying anything uh, to the guns. And it was really impressive. Nobody did something like this. So we thought, yeah, let's create a law and you know, we'll have this huge buybacks. And the law, when the law was approved, had the buyback provision. And the first buybacks were not working because there was a component that we didn't really thought of, which was the trust. On the law, when it became policy, where would you take your gun? To a police station. Right? So people don't trust the police and they say, why would I take the gun to police? They're going to rob the gun, they're going to sell to a criminal, they're going to you know, assault me on, on the police station. So it was really important to make a change to the law and it's a very simple high, high technology innovation. Uh, it's the sledge hammer that we put in every, so we destroyed, kind of, we made a provision that every gun was kind of hit. It was, you were not able to use it immediately after you got these guns everywhere and we got civil society to participate in churches and together with the police to get the guns. We got 500,000 guns in the first year of the law, half a million guns, it's a lot of guns uh, out of the streets. We still have a lot of them but you know in the first it's, 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 it's quite, so I think that you can but you have to think about every component of, of, the, of what made the program successful and again Technology might make this so much easier today. A lot of the things that we want to control and turn off, we can do it with technology. So maybe scaling up is not going to be such a huge uh, problem as, as it is now. Fantastic. Uh, Lushanara, the, uh, two of the other questions addressed something else. Um, Alex from Hong Kong said, what if parents are too busy to engage? Um, and Ahmed from Libya said, can you bring business to the table to tell us what skills students should be learning? Mm -hmm. And a question I think that comes out of that is if you're going to engage in the local community, is there a risk that it's only certain people that will engage? Um, so I, I just wondered if you could, you could speak to this point of the, the yep. two busy parents, if you get business at the table, how do you make that work? It was actually a question right at the beginning about multiculturalism. Is there a risk that just one cultural or ethnic group or one wealth group or income group is going to take over and sort of run the school for everybody else once you start engaging? How do you overcome that? Well, I, I think engagement has to be based on uh, the needs of, a, of the community you're serving, and that will vary depending on the social as well as uh, demographic and uh, ethnic profile of an area. But, but, I, but I think um, the point about our parents too busy, if you take middle class, busy middle class parents, yes, time is a major challenge, but they are very actively involved in their schools, uh, schools and their children's education. Um, in many circumstances, you find that actually it's um, fa families who are from less well-off backgrounds um, who may be doing very uh, demanding jobs, doing lots of different shifts. So time is a ma massive issue. But it's also about working out what is going to be relevant to those parents and the institutions being able to be agile enough to respond to people's changing working patterns. Uh, that may mean um, teachers actually going into 
community centres into people's homes, into the workplace, finding ways of responding. Now, that will depend on the, the, the area they're in, using technology more uh, to connect with, to, to, with parents. But it's clear that, uh, from evidence in the UK certainly, that leadership, management, the involvement of parents are critical uh, in raising standards, alongside, of course, teaching, uh, teaching quality and so on, uh, and partnership. So uh, there is quite a lot of evidence that, that it makes a difference, but I think the how will depend on how far institutions are given the space uh, and time to be able to do that. And that's often, that, that's often where the, the question that was raised earlier about how do you, how do you engage government and how, do you, how does government respond to what's needed in people's lives uh, and how is it responsive enough is a big challenge. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I'd say, and this applies to the current UK government as much as any other, is their failure and inability to listen to what practitioners will say, what a local government uh, may say to them. Uh, and so you take the, somebody raised at the end, um, one of, uh, I, sorry, I didn't catch your name. Uh, you take the example of schools and free schools. Um, it's not that the idea of parent-led schools is a bad thing. I mean, I, I certainly was involved with, as I say, studio schools, which is about an employer oriented new kind of school within a local framework where you could identify where the need is. It's that this government has established schools, preschools, in areas that don't actually need those schools. It's about not working with the local area and the local community to identify what those needs are. So you need much more connection and collaboration between the centre and the local. And I think one of the biggest challenges for any national government is their inability, because they tend to be very big and quite monolithic and quite bureaucratic, uh, and things take time to change, um, however much they're willing to, and it's not that public servants aren't willing to and eager to, often governments and politicians want to see that, but changing things can take so much time. Um, so you need systems of feedback that are uh, not so regular that you know, it's a bewildering amount of challenge that then dis distorts delivery um, and is too disruptive, but enough to be uh, an effective check uh, on whether a service uh, or a policy is actually going to have the impact that it should to improve, for instance, in education standards or respond to shortage of school places as, as, you've got, as we've got in the UK at the moment, where you've got schools being built in areas that don't need them and schools not being built in areas that do need them. Uh, primary school places is, is a good example of that. On your point about diversity and, and multiculturalism and policy, I think, um, for like any society, uh, you ha for any society, you have to have a, a clear framework, a legal framework that provides equal protection uh, within which to operate. And in the UK, I think we've got a very proud record um, uh, of having a strong anti-discrimination framework. And when my party was in government, we did that across the different equality strands um, and extended rights into the workplace uh, for religious, to protect, prevent religious discrimination <coughs> as well as discrimination against those with disabilities and on the basis of sexual orientation, which is a big um, shift uh, in recognition that discrimination in the workplace uh, was not covered uh, uh, adequately. The, the challenge now is as you get this massive change and lots and lots of cuts in services, how um, the system can measure the impact of those cuts to different groups to a differential rate in terms of race and social class. And that takes me on to the point about employability and employment and what do employers what would employ, you know, if you bring employers in, what would they say? And, and you mentioned, somebody mentioned the point about employers will say, um, just t tell them to show up on time uh, and so on. Well, I actually think that's, that, yes, they do say that. Uh, and there are some basic, basic skills about um, uh, young people making transitions um, from being a student where you can get away with, um, you know, turning up late to a lecture uh, or whatever. I'm sure none of the students in this room do that. <laughs> um, but I think there's something much more fundamental going on, certainly in the UK, which is about the narrowing of uh, social class groups the further up you go through the system.
from universities to uh, professors to you know the institutions, the, the kind of major institutions in our country. You see that in politics, you see that in business, you see that in the law, and it's getting narrower. And if you look at the recent Social Mobility Commission report, they found that that's got, I mean, we've, had, we've got less social mobility now than we've had for decades. Now, that raises a question about how you get people, the one million who are not, not in work. The early warning systems are there. You don't need the early warning systems because we already know, and we've known it for a long time. I guess the question is, how does, that, uh, how does the evidence and the information, and across Europe, you've got even higher youth unemployment, how does that then trigger and force action by governments? That's the challenge. And uh, young people are not the ones who are, you know, using their democratic, even if they can have their vote, uh, you know, and are, are over, over the age, uh, up to the age where they can vote, and not using it in order to scare politicians into action if they're not going to do it out of an, a, a national imperative. The question is how you find, uh, how you open up institutions for those groups who are not getting into the labour market. And if you look at the social demographics of those who are not in work, they will still, certainly in the UK, be in uh, less advantaged backgrounds. You're now seeing more graduate unemployment. And within that, certainly in the research I did, which led me to set up a programme myself, because I was so outraged by the lack of any help to, to get these people into work, was that if you came from a uh, working class background, um, if you were the first generation to go to university, then your chances of getting into these places was in, in traditional, in, in the professional in, uh, institutions or in the banking and, and financial world, was much slimmer. And it's because you didn't have the social capital, you didn't have the connections as well as the social skills. So middle class parents and upper middle class parents were in a better position to be able to help their kids when they left university to find that placement paid or unpaid um, uh, in order to get their experience and build up a CV that looks like they, they look, that enables them to look the part and get the employability skills uh, in order to access the big jobs in the city or, or wherever in, the, in those graduate jobs. So there's something much more fundamental going on which is about the tacit uh, value and tacit um, skills and networks and opportunities that you get if you come from a background where you have access to these professions and institutions. So I, I think that actually what we need is to look at those things that are missing um, for those groups who can't access, for instance, jobs, uh, the, the one million who are not in work, um, by, by trying to institutionalize or build institutions with, ne with people who are networked into those institutions who can kind of act like, I call it, uh, I, I, you know, shortcut uh, phrase, act like pushy middle class parents on behalf of those who don't have that sort of network of people who are around them to help them make that pathway into employment. Now, those people can also be employers. It's not a, it's not a conflict. It's about looking at how you co-create co institutions that can um, sub, sub, well, supplement um, the things that young people, for whatever reason, it might be family circumstances, it might be social class background, they don't have. And I think unless we're, um, uh, in a, we're prepared to put our finger on the non-visible, non-tangible skills that, <coughs> you know, i.e. not qualifications, the additional things you need, the attributes you need to get into the workplace, which you, you can learn if you come from certain backgrounds more easily, then you're going to have this structural problem with trying to get people into work. And my final point is, you need a government that listens, wh whichever party. If you take the work pro program in the UK, the current Conservative-led government, um, and it's my only party political comment, but it's a serious, serious, serious one, um, the current government decided to abolish a program we established called the Future Jobs Fund, um, which did have the result of getting people, young people, into work. They abolished it immediately after getting into power, even though we said to them, keep it until you replace it with a new program for young people. Because if you have this big gap, you're leaving people high and dry, uh, and you're going to prolong uh, the unemployment they suffer. They replaced it with something called the work program. Uh, which has 3% success rate. Uh, in my constituency, it's 2% success rate. And they're continuing to persevere with this policy. So my final point would be, if something is broke, 
then get rid of it, replace it with something that works. Um, uh, and of course, if it's, if it's not broke, yes, don't leave try it. to leave it. So that, that, that's just a parting comment about employability skills. Fantastic. Well, um, you know, this discussion has really uh, reaffirmed my belief um, in the incredible value of bringing academic and practitioner communities together. If this had been a purely academic discussion of social policy, we most certainly would have been discussing the results of randomized control trials and designing new incentive systems for social policy, most definitely. The first point that one of you made was about the difference between designing policy and implementing it. And I think our, our panelists and your questions have elucidated just three quick takeaways for us. You know, the first, which is really interesting, is that it has not been a discussion about incentives or, or um, uh, testing um, or data even. It's been a discussion that says that the social innovations that work are innovations that create more engagement. And I think that's very interesting. Engagement of parents in the schools in Rushanara's constituency, the personalized collaborative relationships that you've discussed in schools in Brazil, working with the frontline deliverers, as Paul Collier mentioned, working with the teachers who are delivering, making sure, as, as one of the questioners asked, that there is trust between those delivering and the citizens to whom they're delivering. So the first lesson has been that social policy innovation needs to be about engagement, even more than about incentive systems um, and design. The second lesson is about the data, which is data is great. I think everybody is agreed. It's good to know what you've got. It's something Michelle Harrison said on the last panel. Data can, can, can help give us early warnings. It can tell us something is going wrong. These practitioners have said, be careful. Be careful of what you're measuring and how soon you're measuring it. Don't forget that things take time to work. And some of the really important things that you might want to measure, you might not be able to measure, like the quality of the engagement of the stakeholders. And staying the course, Rushanara's point, it takes persistence, it takes staying the course. And then finally, third, Denise's point that if you're going to try to scale up, you need to design for scale in the first instance. That there's real risks to piloting a policy for a small community and then when it gets taken to scale all the most important parts of it get dropped because they're too difficult to do at scale and everybody stands back and says gosh why didn't that work so can i on on behalf of everybody thank our two panelists for a fantastically rich discussion <laughs>